Tonight, from president to citizen, a U.S. appeals court rejects former President Donald Trump's claim for presidential immunity in his election interference case. Trump's legal team prepares on escalating proceedings to the Supreme Court on grounds of threatening the bedrock of the republic. Voting for democracy. Pakistan prepares to head to the polls. The country remains on edge with political factions struggling to gain power in a race filled with ambiguities. Peace on the horizon? The US and Israel prepare for discussions with Hamas following a much-awaited response from the militant group on the most recent truce deal. What could these new negotiations mean for the future of the conflict? Find out tonight. And sibling heroics. A story of one brave 80-year-old using her wits in the worst situation imaginable, saving herself and her sister in the process. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Ava Verna World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here's Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. A very good evening and thanks for tuning in this Wednesday night on to another edition of World News. There's a lot for us to cover this evening with Hamas responding to peace talks and Chile's unexpected loss of its former Prime Minister. But first an update on Trump's legal troubles. A federal appeals court in Washington has ruled unanimously that former President Donald Trump is not immune from prosecution on charges that he plotted to overturn the results of a 2020 election. A Trump campaign spokesman said the decision will be appealed to the Supreme Court, saying that prosecuting a president for official acts violates the Constitution and threatens the bedrock of their republic. Former President Donald Trump today dubbed Citizen Trump by a three-judge panel in Washington, ruling Mr. Trump is not immune from prosecution. The court saying we cannot accept that the office of the presidency places its former occupants above the law for all time thereafter. The Trump campaign saying he'll appeal the decision. Trump himself bemoaning the ruling, saying... A president of the United States must have full immunity in order to properly function and do what has to be done for the good of our country. Special counsel Jack Smith charged Mr. Trump last summer for his efforts to reverse the 2020 election results and stop the peaceful transfer of power. We will never give up. We will never concede. Mr. Trump's legal team has been trying to get the charges tossed out for months, arguing he should be completely immune from prosecution for any acts he took as president. The court today unpersuaded, saying we cannot accept former President Trump's claim that a president has unbounded authority to commit crimes that would neutralize the most fundamental check on executive power, the recognition and implementation of election results. The Trump campaign capitalizing on the court's decision today with a fundraising plea as the Republican frontrunner frequently uses his legal setbacks as fuel for his latest White House bid. If you have a president that doesn't have immunity, he's never going to be free to do anything because the opposing party will always indict him as soon as he leaves the White House. With today's ruling, Mr. Trump's only hope at avoiding trial is for the Supreme Court to find he is immune, which would have major implications in the other legal cases he faces as well. On the road to the White House now, Nevada's primary concluded with a loss for Nikki Haley in a state where she refused to compete against frontrunner Donald Trump. With the Nevada caucuses just around the corner, Ms. Haley's campaign has derided the system in Nevada as rigged for Mr. Trump and said repeatedly that she was refusing to participate. An embarrassing defeat for Republican presidential candidate Nikki Haley on Tuesday as projections in Nevada's primary show her losing to ballots marked none of these candidates. Donald Trump was not on the state-run ballot, and many of those who chose to vote against Haley were supporters of the former president, like this man. Well, I actually voted for none of the above here because uh, the primary here didn't include all of the people, and I'll be going in Thursday for the caucus to vote for Trump. There are two Republican ballots because a state law requires a primary to be held, but presidential nominating caucuses are run by state political parties, not the state. 
and the Trump-friendly Nevada Republican Party are holding their caucus separately on February the 8th. Trump will be on that ballot, but not Haley. Last week, Trump urged Nevada voters to ignore the primary on Tuesday and only vote in Thursday's caucus. With over two-thirds of Tuesday's ballots counted, Haley had 32 percent of the votes. The projected winner was none of these candidates, with over 61 percent support, according to pollster Edison Research. Meanwhile, U.S. President Joe Biden easily won the state's Democratic primary after dominating his party's first nominating race in South Carolina on Saturday. Some who backed Biden said they're just hoping to stop Trump from getting back into the White House. With more than 70 percent of votes counted, Biden had 90 percent support. As the incumbent president, Biden faces little opposition from within his own party to run for re-election. Pakistan's 127 million voters get to elect a new parliament tomorrow. The elections are the 12th in the country's 76-year history, which has been marred by economic crises, military takeovers and martial law, militancy, political upheavals and wars with India. 44 political parties are vying for a share of the 266 seats that are up for grabs in the National Assembly or the lower house of parliament with an additional 70 seats reserved for women and minorities. Pakistan goes to polls amid rising militant attacks in recent months and the jailing of Imran Khan, the winner of the last national election, who has been dominating the headlines despite the economic crisis and the wars threatening the nuclear armed country. Two explosions near electoral candidates' offices in Pakistan's southwestern province of Baluchistan killed at least 26 people and wounded dozens, raising concerns over security on the eve of a general election. Authorities have said that they are boosting security at polling booths. It was not immediately clear who was behind the attacks. After the election, the new parliament chooses a prime minister. If no party wins an outright majority, then the one with the biggest share of assembly seats can form a coalition government. Pakistani politics are dominated by men and three parties, the Pakistan Muslim League Nawaz, the Pakistan Tehreek-e Insaf and the Pakistan People's Party. The top contender in Pakistan Muslim League Nawaz and on its ballot are two former prime ministers, Nawaz Sharif and his younger brother, Shebaz Sharif. In some news that shocked the nation of Chile, the country's ex-president Sebastian Piñera died in a helicopter crash, sending the country he led for two terms into mourning and prompting an outpouring of condolences from leaders across Latin America. Sebastian Piñera, the former president of Chile, died in a helicopter crash on Tuesday. The helicopter carrying Piñera and three others plunged into a lake in southern Chile. The 74-year-old was pronounced dead by rescue personnel at the scene, while the other passengers survived. Two sources told Piñera was the pilot, although officials have not confirmed that, nor the helicopter's intended destination. Chilean President Gabriel Boric declared three days of mourning for his predecessor. Chile somos todos, y debemos soñarlo, dibujarlo. We send a big hug to his family and loved ones in these hard times, he said. Preparations are underway for a state funeral, slated for Friday. Chile's interior minister said Piñera's body was recovered from the lake near the town of Lago Ranco. Piñera served two non-consecutive terms between 2010 and 2022. He was perhaps best known internationally for his role in overseeing the spectacular rescue in 2010 of 33 trapped miners. In Chile, he was known as a successful businessman. The son of a prominent centrist politician, Piñera was a Harvard-trained economist. He made his fortune by introducing credit cards to Chile in the 1980s. His first term was boosted by rapid economic growth, but he was often seen as out of touch with the country's fast-changing society. Both his presidencies were marred by frequent protests, including students demanding education reform in his first term, and broader, often more violent protests against inequality in his second term. Piñera is survived by his wife and four children. In some hopeful news to the dire situation in Israel and Palestine, Hamas has reportedly responded in a positive light to the recent peace deals brokered by the U.S. While the specifics are unclear, the nations involved are seemingly eager to secure better exchanges as well as more room for humanitarian aid to the worst affected areas. 
U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken is set to be in Israel on Wednesday to discuss the next steps in a ceasefire plan for Gaza after Hamas gave what it called a positive response to the proposal the evening before. There's still a lot of work to be done, but we continue to believe that an agreement is possible and indeed essential. Blinken was speaking in Qatar during a lightning tour of the Middle East. U.S., Qatari and Egyptian mediators are preparing a diplomatic push to bridge differences between Israel and Hamas on the proposed truce that includes the release of the remaining hostages held in Gaza. That offers the, the prospect of extended calm, hostages out, more assistance in. Uh, that would clearly be beneficial to everyone, uh, and I think that offers the best path forward. But uh, there's a lot of work to be done to, uh, to achieve it. Hamas replied on Tuesday to the framework drawn up more than a week ago by U.S. and Israeli spy chiefs at a meeting with the Egyptians and Qataris. In a statement later, Hamas said it responded in a positive spirit to ensure, quote, a comprehensive and complete ceasefire, ending the aggression against our people, ensuring relief, shelter and reconstruction, lifting the siege on the Gaza Strip and achieving a prisoner swap. The mediators did not disclose details of the response, but Qatar said it gave them hope, while Egyptian security sources told that Hamas showed flexibility. There's been a response. In Washington, U.S. President Joe Biden said cautiously that the reply showed some movement toward a deal. Sources close to the talks have said the truce would last at least 40 days. During this time, Gaza's militants would free the remaining civilian hostages taken during the deadly cross-border attack into Israel on October the 7th. In the next phases, they would hand over soldiers and dead bodies of hostages in return for releases of Palestinians imprisoned in Israel. The truce would also increase the flow of food and other aid to Gaza's desperate civilians. The Israeli Prime Minister's office said late on Tuesday the details of Hamas's response were being, quote, thoroughly evaluated by the officials involved in the negotiations. Let's go in for a short commercial break. We'll be back with updates on Turkey and year after their devastating quakes and much more. Stay tuned. Welcome back. An year on since the devastating earthquakes that decimated parts of Turkey, leaving countless dead and injured, mourners flooded the streets in remembrance and called for action on the negligence of the government to the crises at the time and following the disaster. It's been one year since a deadly 7.8 magnitude earthquake killed more than 50,000 people in Turkey, some 5,900 in Syria and left millions homeless. Early on the morning of the anniversary, 10,000 people gathered to hold a vigil in Hatay province, Turkey's worst hit, as some protested what they called government negligence in the aftermath. Local authorities were booed during speeches as calls for the government to resign rang out. Residents believe many died not because buildings collapsed, but from waiting for so long, trapped in the rubble and the cold. Merv Gersel threw flowers into the Asi River for family members who died. This is the echo of people's inner pain. It is an echo of how much people have suffered. There is no way to describe how to make up for the pain here. These people's hearts are bleeding. Hatay's Orthodox Church and its followers held mass in the ruins of its church crippled by the shaking one year ago today. And a march of victims protesting what they say was government neglect in the aftermath. A Sun Selenk's sister and brother-in-law were inside this building which collapsed. The area has been cleared with no sign of their remains and only rubble left behind. They haven't given up hope of finding their bodies. They were my everything. She was a very good mother. A very modern woman. Exactly a year ago, this newborn baby covered in dust was plucked from the rubble in Jandaris, Syria. She would survive, but her whole family was killed in the earthquake. Named Afa after her mother, 
She now lives with her uncle, Khalil Al Sawadi, as she reaches her first birthday. The last year passed on us with sadness, poverty and everything. Afra means everything to me. First, a member was added to my family. And secondly, she reminds me of her father, mother and siblings every time I look at her. When she eats, she reminds us of her parents. When she laughs or cries, she reminds us of her parents. Turkish President Tayyip Erdogan visited a graveyard to mark the day. He stated on social media site X that the pain of the loss from the earthquakes was as fresh now as it was a year ago, adding that his government had moved in the immediate aftermath of what they call the disaster of the century. With Asian markets seeing a boom, Western nations continue to pay close attention to the region's economic powerhouses, specifically China, in hopes to maintain steady ties, with predictions for a financial whirlwind ahead. Following that story for us tonight is other than as Nevanmi Ranasinghe standing by in Malaysia with the latest. Nevanmi? Thank you, Anuradhi. China's Vice Commerce Minister Wang Shouwen also said China-U.S. economic and trade cooperation is a stabilizing power in the relations between the two countries in a video call with the U.S. Under Secretary of Commerce for International Trade Melissa Laga. He also expressed concerns about the U.S. restrictions on semiconductors and cloud services in China, fair treatment of Chinese companies in the U.S., and photovoltaic restrictions. Meanwhile, business leaders in the United Kingdom lauded China's economic achievements in the past decades and said that they stand ready to boost mutually beneficial cooperation with China. Chinese ambassador to the UK, Shen Zhuang, expressed the hope in a speech that more people in the two countries can become icebreakers in the new era. Spread correct understanding, practice mutual respect, promote win-win cooperation and contribute to addressing global challenges. Chinese Premier Li Chang expressed the hope that visionary people from all walks in of life in China and Britain will carry forward the ice-breaking spirit. Back to you, Anuradhi. All right, thank you very much. That was other there in the World News Special Correspondent Devanmi Rana Singha in Malaysia. Thanks again. Brussels will scrap a plan to halve pesticide use, marking a further concession to protesting farmers who have spooked EU governments and another blow to its environmental agenda. The retreat by European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen is part of a wider scaling back of her green ambitions in a bid to placate farmers, a critical constituency for her centre-right party that is seeking to remain the EU's most powerful parliamentary group in elections this summer. We have other there in a world news special correspondent Shanika Dharmaratna in Vietbesk, Belarus with the latest. Yes, Anuradhi. The Commission left out targets for the agricultural sector from a roadmap on how the bloc should cut its greenhouse gas emissions by 90% by 2040. The Commission had presented the proposal to cut pesticide use with the worthy aim to reduce the risks of chemical plant protection products. But, Wante Lion, acknowledged that issues for farmers had escalated in recent years, saying the initiative had become a symbol of polarization, and that she would propose to her fellow commissioners that it be withdrawn. It had already been blocked by member states and MEPs. Demonstrations by agricultural groups have become increasingly disruptive in recent weeks spreading across several EU members, member states, including Germany, France, Belgium, Poland, and Romania. Spanish farmers staged demonstrations in several regions late yesterday. To quell the protests, which have caused significant damage in cities such as Paris and Brussels, the Commission has agreed to ease parts of its environmental agenda, including watering down planned rules on animal welfare and allowing cultivation of land intended to be left fallow to rejuvenate nature. Back to you, Anuradhi. All right, thank you. That was other than a World News Special Correspondent Shanaka Dharmaratna in Vietbesk, Belarus with the latest. Let's go in for a short commercial break. More World News on the other side.
Welcome back. An array of unconventional, privately funded plans to exploit the moon, including as a site for human ashes and sports drink containers, has gathered steam in recent years. But it has also sparked a legal debate over how we use the moon. There's a new legal debate about the moon that started with human ashes and a can of Pokhari sweat. They were among the items on a recent private moon mission by U.S. company Astrobotic, which ultimately failed to reach the moon's surface. What they were planning to do with the Japanese sports drink is unclear, but the trip had raised legal concerns about the proper use of the moon amid an array of unconventional, privately funded plans to exploit it. No one country has jurisdiction over it, so how should it be governed? Right now, there are no U.S. laws or standards outlining what's acceptable on the moon's surface. That's an issue that'll gain more attention, as NASA increasingly leans on private companies to cut the costs of its trips to the moon. NASA says it has no control over what private companies put in their landers either, but says payload standards could be created in the future. Lawyers with space law expertise worry that the absence of regulations will not only make the moon a target for contamination and litter, but also spark international disputes. Few countries have adopted standards for moon behavior, and the rules remain unclear in international law. Another private U.S. lunar lander is due to launch next month, and the lack of rules risks bringing Washington in conflict with the widely ratified 1967 Outer Space Treaty, according to lawyers. That pact says countries must authorize and supervise the activities of non-governmental entities. That raises the stakes for the space industry, the Biden administration, and lawmakers who have battled for months over how to regulate novel commercial space activities, with industry groups resisting what they call innovation-stifling regulations. One entrepreneur says overly restrictive regulations could, quote, destroy an industry before it gets off the ground. Do you believe you have the confidence to face a threatening situation with a clear head? Well, a quick-thinking eight-year-old has proven to have nerves of steel and brains to top it off as she saves herself and her sister after the car they were in had been stolen at a local car wash in Wisconsin. The girls were with their dad who stepped away for a moment to give directions when the car was stolen. Take a look. A routine stop at a Wisconsin quick trip turning into a nightmare. Someone just stole my car on 27th Street with my two kids in the car. But an eight-year-old girl's quick thinking. I was scared. I was like, what's happening? Saving her and her sister after a shocking carjacking. I was really just about an arm's length away from my car. Adam Jorgensen says he went to grab a cloth to dry off his vehicle after a car wash when someone asked him for directions. Then suddenly, I heard the screeching of our tires. The car was gone with his daughters, two year old Autumn and eight year old Charlie, in the back seat. He told me to get out of the car. I was like, oh, what should I do? Should I run and be a scaredy cat or should I save my sister too? Charlie telling she knew her dad had the keys, not the carjackers, and she decided to stay put. The driver ditched the car and the kids at the Batteries Plus store about a mile down the road. And Charlie acted fast, her little sister panicking. Wait, go dad, go. Grabbing her dad's phone from the front of the car and calling her mom, leaving this message. Their dad, back at Quick Trip, frantically on the phone with police. We are over by Batteries Plus, and then an officer's going to come over and meet you at the Quick Trip, okay? All right, but you guys have my kids. The incident reflecting a bigger trend in carjackings, rising 17% from 2022 to 2023 in nearby Milwaukee. And nationally, carjacking's up 93% from 2019 to 2023, according to a new Council on Criminal Justice report, tracking rates across 10 U.S. cities. Back in Oak Creek, the police department said it took three suspects into custody and it's seeking felony charges this week. Now, a family reunited. I ran as fast as I could out of the back of that cop car to hug them. Hoping others will learn how quickly things can go wrong. Remember you won't bother drying your car? <laughs> ah, yes, we'll dry the car at home now as well. And that is all we have for you on World News Tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more updates on Clee Global Events. See you next time. Have a good night.